Terry Hertog is next. Dr. Hertog is a very active gentleman. He's president of the World Society of Anti-Aging Medicine. He's president of the International Hormone Society. He's president of the European Academy of Quality of Life and Longevity Medicine. He's the author of the Hormone Handbook. And so I'd like to present him now. Also, one other thing, I almost wore that same jacket. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you also for the organizing, uh, organizers to let me talk to you. Um, today I'm going to talk about a very specific topic. Um, in my life, in my professional life, I was I completely changed my practice when I started to treat with growth hormone treatment about 1994. And the second hormone to change completely my professional life is IGF-1. Because IGF-1 is as growth hormone, but maybe even more potent and more powerful than growth hormone. And you know all, probably, that up to now, growth hormone is considered as the number one hormone therapy to, to do anti-aging medicine. So since I'm working with IGF-1, I don't do any more anti-aging medicine. Finished. It's reversing aging. This is really a hormone that can help you more than others reverse aging, at least if you're able to combine it with growth hormone, because synergy between hormones is extremely important. Um, I don't know how to work with this. So, anti-aging medicine becomes old, and I think we have to talk more about reversing aging. And every three months for the moment, I organize conferences, seminars, I come with some new therapy that can go in this sense, not more to stop or slow down aging, or to um, do a skeptical medicine and to try to do superficial anti-aging medicine, but really to reverse aging. One of the treatments, for example, I, I'm 53 and I started having presbycia. And presbycia, you know, it's difficult to and I couldn't, even with glass, I couldn't see because I keep always moving when I read. So that's a problem. And so I read somewhere that you could reverse prosthesia by doing mesotherapy. So I did mesotherapy, added calcitonin, it's very important, and I added growth and I added IGF-1. And now I can see without any problem. I do have to repeat every three or four months the injections, but it's, it's, it's a miracle. I didn't find anything possible. And so let's look at what IGF-1 was thought. How can you recognize the people among you, among yourself, if you have an IGF-1 deficiency? First, let's look a bit at the structure of IGF-1. The structure of IGF-1 is, like it's called, insulin-like growth factor 1. It looks like insulin, and it has insulin-like effects, about 6% of, uh, on the same dose and milligrams expressed, it has about 6% of effect of insulin, which is a lot because IGF-1 is a much greater quantity in our blood than insulin. So this is how it would look like stereochemically. So it has to go on a receptor. If you don't have good receptors, or they're not clean because there's um, some infectious agents there, or there's, uh, you have diabetes and there's a lot of sugar withholding, it will not work so well. And the actions of IGF-1, uh, something that's a little wrong here, there was MSH, but the actions is basically that it makes a child grow, it also makes a child grow in utero. That means that um, if a child or an unborn baby in utero has no growth mold, there's no problem. The final length at birth will be sufficient. It's only later there will be growth delays. But if the child does not have enough IGF-1 in utero, it will not grow a lot. It will be very, very small, and it will almost have no face development. No nose, no chin almost, no, very flat. And apart from giving a skeletal growth that begins very, very early in lifetime, it has a lot of other effects. It can promote cell growth, you can make new cells, you can repair nerves with IGF-1. Even if there's damage, even if everything's cut, there can be new regeneration of nerves. And it's also important for carbohydrate metabolism. This is a hormone that works differently than growth hormone. Growth hormone slightly increases the blood sugar. And IGF-1 decreases it. It works like insulin. And so these are the faces of the children who did not have enough 
Uh, Jeff, why not? I don't know if you can. I can show something. There's no uh, pointer. And, um, but you see the faces are relatively like, Look at the first one uh, upwards at the left corner. You see that there's a small nose, a small chin. There's no good face development. These are children that have you know, um, enough growth on them, but have an IGF-1 resistance. They don't make IGF-1. And uh, there's a growth hormone resistance that doesn't go on the receptors, so they cannot make IGF-1. They need to have IGF-1. Now, with aging, IGF-1 declines quite quickly. Not as quick as growth hormone declines, because that's one of the quickest declines we have uh, after DHEA. But you see that IGF-1 steeply declines. And if you put patients, for instance, on growth hormone, you will see that after age 50, it doesn't seem to work so well. It doesn't seem to work so well. They don't have this muscle trophy anymore as well that they had before. Because under stimulus of growth hormone, IGF-1 is mainly made under stimulus of, uh, the stimulus of uh, growth hormone, um, it doesn't seem to work. There's an aging of the enzyme systems, and you need to add in a treatment IGF-1. So, I don't know, it goes upwards with me. That's that possible. Okay, this way. So um, this is a study that shows you the comparison between the action on the glucose level of IGF-1 and insulin. And so basically on a molar basis, IGF-1 was only 6% less potent, but as it's a much bigger quantity in our blood, it's the second hormone, most abundant hormone in our blood, it is relatively potent. Now, with age, we don't not only have a decline of IGF-1, but our cells become resistant to IGF-1. There's um, in senescent fibroblasts, you see that there's a less IGF-1 receptor, less receptor. So even if you have enough IGF-1, it doesn't seem to work as well. So that will also cause an aging. And how can you overcome it? By giving more IGF-1 to the patient. And... What are the physical signs of IGF-1? Well, basically, it's in adults very like growth hormone. This is an adult with enough growth hormone, enough IGF-1. What do you see? He's very strong. Tomorrow you'll see the front side, but I have to stay tomorrow. <laughs> After the conference. So everything's tonic. That's a, a, that's a sign of health of enough IGF-1, enough growth hormone. These are the hormones who make our body as, uh, give a sort of maximal firmity. A person that doesn't have a firm body, has loose muscles, is not a healthy person, and is a person who's likely to have an IGF-1 deficiency or a growth hormone deficiency. You see here, uh, typically like in growth hormone, you have this, um, the droopy eyelids, everything's falling, being atrophic, or uh, there's a, an eyebrow thinning that you can see here, and sagging cheeks, more pronounced wrinkling. So it really gives the major characteristics of aging are due to growth hormone IGF-1 deficiency. You see here, here already, that man starts to have an IGF-1 deficiency. In certain sense, this is not a growth hormone deficiency, this is an IGF-1. If you have IGF-1 and you don't have growth hormone, but you have enough IGF-1, you won't have that. If you have enough growth hormone, but you don't have IGF-1, you will have sagging cheeks. So the hormone behind most of the action of growth hormone, let's say 60-65%, is IGF-1. Without it, growth hormone does not work well. You see it, these droopy triceps, for example, improves quite constantly with the treatment. Also, you have more uh, muscle hypertrophy, dehydration falls. It's not very tonic when you squeeze your, finger, uh, your, your thumb on the hand of your patient. And you get those longitudinal lines, which are actually the wrinkles of nails, but are, uh, go away when you give IGF-1 or growth hormone after about 12 months or 18 months if you have a good treatment. And if the person eats enough protein, because the hormone will not work if you don't have enough building blocks. Also here, um, for example, you have here ab abdominal fat, for example, and a droopy belly. This is a hormone who really 
improves the muscle tonus. So you won't get that if the person has enough IGF-1 or growth hormone. So basically, when you see people, slowly more and more people get to be like this. It's all over the world. It's not only in America. In England, it's even more, I think, than America. And we're having this also in Europe. Because the food is not good. But what the food does is also decrease hormone levels. Among them, IGF-1. Also, the skin thinning and the droopy belly, you see this sort of aging, can be linked to IGF-1 or growth hormone deficiency. Also, thicker ties with silylate. This is anti silylate hormone. You have much more um, muscle tonus with this hormone. Sagging inner sides of the thighs. I had patients, they took huge doses of growth hormone. Huge, I mean... Uh, around uh, 0.5 to 0.6 milligrams, which is normally an overdose for an adult patient. And having improvement, but the sagging in the thighs were still there. And then suddenly, the patient took IGF-1. That was my first patient, actually, on the treatment. Took IGF-1. And what happened is she said, Doctor, I took 10 times the dose that you, you said, but can I continue? After one month of treatment, she said, I have rejuvenated 20 years in one month. Imagine. I think she was too enthusiastic. But when I saw her, she had no sagging inner sides of the thighs anymore. Well, it was before. So you understand that I am already on IGF-1 now. Eh? So here, this skin thinning and fatty cushions of the knees, typical for growth hormone. Actually, this is a little more typical to growth hormone deficiency than IGF-1. We will see this because growth hormone has a more powerful effect to decrease fat tissue than IGF-1. IGF-1 alone can even sometimes increase fat tissue. Growth hormone always decreases it. And when you combine both together, we'll see a study, we'll see that actually it's very potent uh, to reduce fat. The best is the couple of the two. Skin thinning, very typical. It's more an IGF-1 deficiency than a growth hormone deficiency. So what is the difference between growth hormone and IGF-1? Well, prenatally, clearly, IGF-1 is the major hormone. If you have a small baby born, well, it it's went to a full term, there's an IGF-1 deficiency. You see this mainly in women who are vegetarians, for example. The, the babies won't not have enough IGF-1. And then facial features, um, 